Enjoy. Hi, my name is Stephanie Patton and I'm a Community Mental Health Services Manager for the Place Extreme Trust and Project Lead Format. Hello, my name is Karen McKellen. I am the team leader for this project and I am also the tour Zero Suicide Project lead for the Psych Extreme Trust. Hello everyone, my name is Inspector Mark Kavanagh. I'm currently the PSNI Operational Lead for Mental Health and the Lead Officer on the MAP project. Uh, unfortunately today we are unable to have any of our NIAS colleagues uh, with us in relation to the presentation due to COVID. So the multi-agency triage team mapped it's a service that comprises mental health professionals working alongside dedicated police officers and paramedic and they travel in what's called a mobile community unit and ambulance. So they, this initiative allows the police, NIAS and health and social care staff to work collaboratively to ensure an individual receives the most appropriate care possible when concerns about their mental health or well-being are reported to emergency services and that reporting is done either by a 999 or 101. So the MAP service aims to support individuals and their families through mental health crisis, deliver safe, effective and high quality client focused care to the individual and their families in a mental health crisis at the right time and the right place and to ensure the safety of vulnerable people. So the MAP service is available to clients as I said presenting with emotional or mental health crisis within the South Eastern Trust and Belfast Trust area over the age of 18. The team will respond to both public and domestic addresses. And the service offers psychiatric and triage assessment and risk assessment by a mental health practitioner, which can be a nurse, social worker or an occupational therapist. Also provides onward referral to community and voluntary services. We have access to talk space via the paramedic and access to legal power for pertaining to criminal justice and that's via the phone. So telephone advice to NIAS clinicians and PSNI officers is also available to those on the ground not involved in the MAP project. I'm now going to hand you over to Inspector Mark Cavanagh who is the lead officer on the project and it came, this project came from an idea that Inspector Cavanagh had and he approached the public health agency and here we are today following Mark's idea. Okay, so whenever we first um, started to look at how we could develop uh, the, the service, um, our first, um, or my first initial thought was looking at demand on policemen um, calls. So what we know from uh, carrying out uh, some detailed research is that as much as 36% of PSNI calls and 25% of NIAS calls have a vulnerability aspect uh, or mental health component to the presentation. Uh, it may well be uh, that as much as 80% of PSNI calls are non-crime related. Okay, so the service in itself has been developed in accordance with uh, government strategy and government policy. Uh, suicide prevention itself, protection of life, health and well-being have all been and remain high priorities of past and current health ministers. We also looked at the uh, Bangor report, which was very influential in considerations for the service itself. And date back to 2016, uh, the Bangor report itself talked about having the courage uh, to work with multidisciplinary teams within the health service. Having said that, uh, when, when we were looking at setting up the MAT service in itself, um, the MAT service wanted and needed to go beyond that. And I think that's where the further external collaboration has come to the fore. So it's not just an internal mechanism, but it's external collaboration is at the centre of the service. Uh, other aspects that have been involved have been the Transforming Your Care policy, dating back to 2011, and of course uh, the draft programme for government which focused on collaborative working, along with, as already mentioned, the Protect Life 2 Suicide Prevention Strategy, uh, which was published back in 2019. Okay, so just briefly I want to touch on why we actually do need the month service and what the, the demand and call volumes like for uh, so the policing services and our partner agencies. So the number of mental health calls that the PSNI receive uh, is one big factor on uh, what the overall demand is. Typically, and by way of example, year on year, the demand on the policing service to deal with mental health calls or any calls that have a mental health component is rising year on year. So we're now sitting currently in around 22,000 to 24,000 calls that have a clear category of mental health. That in itself is quite an umbrella term and certainly very happy to take some questions or comments at the end of the session in relation to that. But again, typically those calls are 
what a police officer or a police call handler uh, means in the mental health. And that's an, an umbrella term. I'm sure everyone uh, in the room and beyond has their own idea of what actually constitutes mental health. Um, the ambulance service in itself have uh, told us anecdotally that uh, they 25% of their calls approximately would have that mental health component, um, which equates to somewhere in the region of 14,000 calls per year. So overall, we are reasonably comparable, but we do find that we are uh, have a slightly higher call volume as a police service than maybe the ambulance service would. Uh, I just want to make a comment on how that might equate to PSNI you know, time spent at hospitals. Um, so again, on average, we could see police uh, dealing with someone in mental health crisis at a hospital in the emergency department anywhere between uh, one hour and on occasions 12, 14, and in excess of, of 20 hours uh, at a time. Again, that all depends on um, how the, the individual is presenting and, of course, the demands on the health service uh, at that time. Um, again, uh, that in itself inherently has a financial implication. Um, police time spent at hospitals, uh, it, it, it costs financially money for police wages, cars, and time spent in the health service. So the longer police are spent at hospital, um, then the more money that's going to uh, cost. Overall, and I think probably the, the, the most important factor there is that it's all centered around patient experience. It cannot ever be right that a patient or anyone in mental health crisis is sitting in a hospital with police officers. Um, there's an issue here over stigmatization and criminalization of something of someone in, in crisis there. And that's something that we as a police service really want to step back from. Uh, we don't want to be treating people uh, or seen to be treating people as criminals. We don't want to be treating anybody in mental health crisis as stigmatizing them in that regard. So our objective here is to try and spend as little time in hospital as we possibly can with the person at the center of our uh, focus. So how, how did that initially come about? So the, the early days of the, uh, the what we used to be triage team uh, initially has been funded through trans transformation funding. And this has provided an opportunity to test different service models before committing to the most effective model for us here in Northern Ireland. So initially we set out uh, with funding secured for a period between July 2018 and March 2020. Um, following the great success of the project so far, additional funding has been secured uh, by the PHA uh, to carry on until March 2021 and hopefully beyond. So in the very early stages, uh, I approached the, the Public Health Agency and our colleagues in the ambulance service back in early 2016. This in itself prompted uh, a series of meetings and visits to other parts of the UK and other police uh, forces and services that had tried something similar to what we were hoping to achieve here in Northern Ireland. It allowed for some field testing of what ingress may have been like or may be like here for back in Northern Ireland. Back to those, those series of uh, meetings and uh, visits went particularly well and we were able to uh, commence a pilot service with the, our colleagues in the Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust back in March 2018 um, which then enabled the service to go live back in July 2018. At the minute the pilot itself uh, does cover the, the Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust catchment area along with Belfast. So the aim, objectives and motivation for the service really are to reach out to people who are experiencing mental health distress who can be difficult to engage at times, to provide the appropriate input at the right time and the right place, to promote the safety and well-being of clients and their families and reduce the fear of clients and families being transported to the emergency department in police vehicles, to provide early intervention with a view to preventing or reducing the progress of a mental illness. And additionally, reducing the need for hospitalisation or onward referral to statutory mental health services. The aim is to enhance the client's experience and offer a more timely and individualised referral to the appropriate or specialist service, and that can be either voluntary services or statutory services. To reduce the number of first time and representers to the emergency department who present with self harm or suicide ideation. So, to reduce the number of frequent users of the police service and the ambulance service, therefore, that increases the turnaround time for NIAS and the police, which frees up resources to deal with other urgent non mental health related incidents. Also, to reduce the allocation of cardiac relief appointments, therefore, freeing up urgent appointments in mental health centres and promote preventative and early intervention approaches, therefore reducing attendance at ED. 
resulting in fear of individuals requiring access to secondary services. At the start of a Saturday night shift, Inspector Mark Havner reminds officers that the MAT team is available if needed. We are here to support you on the front line with any sort of vulnerability that you come across in any sort of calls. A paramedic and psychiatric nurse are also on hand. If you're at all concerned about their health, their mental health or their well-being, contact us. We can give you advice. We can help you manage that patient. We can also support you. If you're with a client tonight who has a suspected overdose, <coughs> you can ring us for advice and we'll be able to work out if that's a toxic dose or not. We're on all night. You can, you, you can contact us anytime. Okay, folks? The idea is to provide on-the-spot yeah, mental well, health support to someone in distress um, as an alternative to a lengthy wait in hospital. More than 100 people have been helped since the scheme began. Calls where the team's help could be needed are monitored at police headquarters. The purpose of that is to try and gain as much information at an early stage that we'll ask our colleagues in health who we're working with here tonight. And Stephanie, what happens then from your point of view? Okay, once an individual has been identified on the system as having a mental health component to their presentation, we would then go to our mental health practitioner, check our systems, we check for risks, vulnerability if they're known to the service, and they, we would then collaborate with their information and take it from there. At 2am, a call comes in that a young man is in distress. He'd been reported missing earlier in the day. He's classed as high risk and threatening to take his own life. His family is deeply concerned. And I'll see if I can at least get him to consent to engage with us and see if I can help settle the situation, if nothing else. After the call, he agrees to allow the team to come to his home. Initially, he was very... Um, unwilling to engage with us but after the conversation he is accepting that he needs help, he wants help and um, he became emotive at the end and was crying um, but he has consented for us to come to the home and see him and to help and support him at this point. The MAT team sets off along with an ambulance and paramedic. They arrive at his home freeing up the police officers who had been with him since the first call came in. The gentleman who we have uh, responded to here is now at home and talking with the, the, the team, the MAT team. Um, so we're just awaiting the, the outcome of the mental health nurse and what the, her conversation with that gentleman is as to what our next course of action would be. It's quite a unique scenario here to have a, a mental health nurse sitting in someone's front living room at 2.30 in the morning. It's offering that level of comfort and support. Around 30 minutes later, the nurse returns and the news is positive. This patient got a specialist service. They got intervention from a very good police service um, who were able to support him in a period of crisis. He got a full medical um, overview from the paramedic and then he was able to avail of a mental health specialist triage assessment by our service. I think the call that we've just attended really epitomised everything that we're trying to achieve here. We had everybody working together. We got frontline officers relieved and again, most importantly, uh, we got someone in crisis who had contacted police to help and support the needed at 2.30 in the morning. And I think that just about says it all. Although confined to Lisburn, North Down and Ards, it's hoped the scheme will eventually be rolled out across Northern Ireland. As you can see from the video that's just played, that there is a time and motion of our service in live time. I'm going to take you now through our service as it operates. So currently we operate on a Friday and a Saturday night from 7pm until 3am. Recently, um, development to our service, we have expanded out to us to cover Sunday and we now cover Sundays from 3pm until 11pm. Of an evening and a shift, we have two PSNI officers on. We have two mental health professionals, one from the Belfast Trust and one from the Southeastern Trust. And we have usually one paramedic. Unfortunately, as a result of COVID and the demands upon the NIAS service, um, our partners in NIAS are unable to fill this shift currently, but they continue to support the project. Um, in usual business, we would have access to a fully operational um, ambulance that transports us. So entry into our services, as has been mentioned, is through um, contact and emergency services on 999 or 101. The first contact goes through the screening processes within each organisation. So um, if the call is through to the police, the police contact centre will um, screen all referrals using their Thrive model, and they will signpost that there and um, referral appropriately um, on a needs basis. 
if it comes through um, our NIAS partners, they will use the Manchester triage system to triage their referral and then signpost it to us. The referrals are then subsequently made to our service. If they come through the contact services, um, we will screen those referrals as a multi-agency organisation. We also receive referrals directly from um, NIAS partners or police on the ground actively involved in cases. When we receive a referral from our partner organisations, we will um, screen those referrals, access in our documents, um, our electronic records, and ensuring that we carry out full risk assessments before we accept the referral. Referrals are agreed as a, a group, so we do not, one um, organisation does not take the lead. We um, agree that the, the referral is appropriate, and then together as a team, we action it. So Matt, in the first instance. So what we do is we triage our referrals and we make telephone contact. We make telephone contact with any people that may be on the ground and um, from a professional organization and we make um, telephone contact to the client. We provide an overview of who we are, um, identifying who we are, what the purpose of our phone call and we take the person through an on the phone screening process. So at that phone call we will um, carry out a full triage assessment we will identify the need of the client, we will identify any current or active risks, and we will signpost appropriately. As you will find out as we go on in this presentation, um, a lot of our work is de-escalated via telephone. Each part of our, um, or our service um, have a role to play, even though the majority of a telephone assessment is completed by the mental health professional. We all have individual identified roles, that, but we all feed into a collaborative, holistic assessment of that client's needs. So the role of the mental health professional during um, a telephone assessment is to complete the triage assessment. This is an uh, evidence-based assessment used um, to identify um, risks, to review the person's um, presentation and to complete a psychosocial assessment. Um, we engage the client fully in that process and we engage the family or significant others in that process. Um, we will identify a uh, collaborative care plan and safety plan with the client and um, it would be the mental health responsibility to make any onward referrals. It is also their responsibility to hold the documents, complete the documents and safely store those documents. The, our paramedic partners, um, their role is to check their systems for alerts. It is their role to um, identify any physical health concerns. If we have a referral for somebody with um, self-harm or have ingested any types of medication, um, it will be our partners in NIAS will access their talk space to ensure that that person is safely able to be managed within the community. They will also identify if there's any medical alerts or anything that the people on the ground would need to be aware of. With regards to our police officer colleagues, um, they again would check their systems to ensure that there is um, a thorough feed into our risk assessments. They will complete their own initial screening process with regards to the referral. They will provide us with all advice and guidance we would re require in any nature of the components of the person's presentation. They will liaise with their colleagues on the ground, providing timely intervention and advice, and they will complete their relative database also. Where we can de-escalate over the phone, we will try to de-escalate over the phone, but we are holistic and inclusive. So um, we are mobile and we are in the community and we are interfacing with clients in a real time um, manner. So we actively do go out to support our colleagues who want to be involved in direct care and half of our business is done on a face-to-face -face bias where we go out as a one unit team and we present to wherever that person will be. So whether that's a domestic address, whether that's in a public place, and um, whether that is um, in, in, in any environment within the Southeastern or the Belfast Trust areas. Um, a lot of it is mirrored. So what we do in a telephone assessment um, will be similarly completed um, when we're in real time motion. So we will go out, we will um, interact with the client, we will engage them, we will lay out the boundaries of the assessment. Um, we will complete all assessments as, um, as previously stated and we will um, engage in real time crisis de-escalation and engagement with the client and their significant others and generally we are able to resolve the crisis presentation in that location resulting in that person being um, supported to maintain their safety in the public and alleviating the need for them to have to be taken to another department um, or on the very rare occasion having to be taken into custody. So when we are out and on the ground, each of us have our own roles. 
The mental health professionals have their role of taking the lead in the assessment. The police officers have their role in ensuring that the power and um, the person's um, human rights are protected and ensuring a safe environment for all. And our medical colleagues and the paramedics, um, they would complete in real time. So they would give a full medical overview of the person. Um, and as the, the physical need would dictate, they will intervene. So our service has the luxury of being able to um, administer low, brief, low intervention treatments for people that are in the community to prevent them having to go to the ED department. Collectively, we will agree that every organisation is happy with the management plan before we end our input with that client at that point. After um, we have seen them, we will complete all onward referrals and um, ensure that they are actioned in a timely manner. So after we have um, finished our engagement with the client, um, we will ensure that um, they are close to our service and that all appropriate follow-up is actioned in a timely manner. And the nature of our service allows us to um, identify the needs of the client in a timely manner, but it allows us to refer them um, to many organisations. Within this pilot, we have been lucky enough to access all um, referral routes for all clients so we have access into statutory services we have um, direct admission into hospital if the person's um, presentation merits it and um, we have excellent um, working relationships and referral pathways with all our um, community-based um, organizations and um, have agreements with them for direct owner referrals for things like the shift as you're aware we are um, in the middle of a pandemic and as with every other service that sits before you today, the result of COVID and the impact that COVID has had on our pilot project has been um, an opportunity for learning, but an, an opportunity to undertake change. COVID has um, made us have to change how we, as a service, deliver our care. And um, we have been very creative in how we achieve this. We as an organisation sat down and decided how best um, to work in partnership during this pandemic as each of our services are um, under significant demand and pressures. Um, as we briefly mentioned, due to these pressures, our colleagues in NIAS have had to um, temporarily step back. However, they continue to refer into our service. They continue to engage in the development and the rollout of this service. Um, but their on the night intervention with us has been reduced. Um, the PSNI have had to um, undertake a bubble system that has reduced their ability to um, interact with other organisations. And as a result of that, there we have had to separate our services of a night so that we are separated, but we communicated highly and effectively during each shift so that we keep in timely manner with what is progressing within the PSNI and our NIAS colleagues. We timely respond to all referrals that are made and the two trust and um, mental health professionals do continue to work together in a shared office um, that is socially distanced and spaced um, to allow us to continue to deliver a high level of care. During the COVID period, we moved to a light model which was effectively these three services um, separating in location, but remaining highly communicated in um, delivery. We will only, um, due to COVID, go as a unit to those cases that are effectively risk assessed and that have the biggest need. Our aim, as always, is to work towards our aims to reduce the attendance at the ET, to reduce the use of Article 130s, and to reduce the use of the card before you leave referrals. Um, we continue to do that um, by the purposes of um, mostly telephone assessments and de-escalation. Our clients are still receiving a very high level of care and intervention. They are receiving timely referrals on to the appropriate services. And those that with the greatest need are still being seen within the community setting as required. So what have we done? So since going live in July 2018, we, to date we have had 649 referrals have been sent or received into the MAP service. So MAP has diverted in total 171 Article 130s. And that is, if someone was taken by the police under Article 130 to the emergency department, they could spend anything from two hours to 14 hours, sometimes longer waiting on a mental health assessment. MAP has also diverted 228 card before you leave referrals. And I know that's been made reference to before. So a card before you leave referral, if someone goes to the emergency department and it deems they're not 
they don't need an emergency assessment at that time. They're given an appointment for the next day, which is called a card before you leave referral. The benefit from presenting a card before you leave referral is we then free up spaces for an urgent appointment in the assessment centres the next day. And to date, Matt has diverted 362 emergency department admissions. So as you can see from our slide, we do report an, an OBA. So that's outcomes-based accountability, and that is reported on quarterly. The stats you'll see at the moment are our six months from April to September, and that's been through the COVID period. So to date, we've diverted 24 clients would have been considered, we believe, for an Article 130. And this is feedback from police officers on the ground who will confirm that. Through the COVID period, 73 clients were considered for ED and only 49 avoided an ED attendance at this stage. This was mainly due to not having a paramedic involved in the service. So if someone had taken an overdose or had superficial lacerations or cuts, on these occasions, they had to be transported to the emergency department and we did not have a paramedic available at that time. But generally, our statistics, the percentage would be much higher for people that have actually avoided an ED attendance. And card before you leave considered, say 45 clients were considered for a card before you leave, but because they were successfully de-escalated and a safety plan put in place and an onboard management plan put in place, we were able to divert 45 clients from card before you leave service. So looking forward, an external independent audit has currently actually it's just been completed and it's out for comment. Funding has been extended until March 2021, but we're hopeful that we will have another year's funding. A business plan has also been completed in partnership with the Public Health Agency with multiple proposals being considered for a regional rollout. And again, the aims for a regional service mapped its transition from Belfast Trust catchment area on the 9th of August 19 with Public Health Agency and the team advocating for a regional rollout of the service. So what we would also hope to do is a more comprehensive service user feedback and look to engage the lived experience expert to be involved in the development of the service and additional funding would be secured. Okay folks, so you've heard a lot of uh, information and you've given a lot of statistics there in relation to the math service. Now we're very happy to open up to either the floor or anyone that would like to ask any questions or comments in relation to the service itself. Is that oh, that is an awful noise. <laughs> right, brilliant. Um, that was a really good presentation. It's so exciting to see that um, that's quality improvement in practice. Uh, Mark identified an issue and sought to find a solution. So, as I said at the start, we're encouraging you to think how can we do this better? And we'll give you an opportunity um, at the end to kind of share your ideas. And obviously, we would encourage you. Um, to submit your ideas for the mental health strategy and stuff as well. Okay, so I have a list of questions here. So the way we're going to work it is we're going to start with the MAP team specific questions um, and then we're going to go into um, some of the other questions we had overflow from the interview style section. So um, what, what is the setup here, Karen? We are. We have a wee bit of Okay. Yeah, maybe make sure everyone else is muted apart from this one. Do you hear it? Is that better? Um, sorry about that. So, what we're going to do is we're just going to rotate the camera between the three of us when the specific question we'll answer between us who answers it. So, with me is Mark, Stephanie, and myself. Okay, super. So um, just to start off, um, these are questions that we've taken from the audience. So will MAP um, service be, will this initiative be rolled out in other trusts in Northern Ireland or how does that work? The aspiration for the MAP there would be to roll the project out regionally and I know the public health agency are very supportive of this. They are currently in links with uh, the Department of Health regarding further resource and funding. Okay, brilliant. And um, is it just a matter of funding that limits the time that it's available? You, you mentioned that it was only available at the weekends or? Yeah. Yeah. Well it would be funding plus staffing issues there. If we had a full-time service we would deplete core services and again that wouldn't be the right thing to do currently. Do you think um, 
do you think that the cost, the benefits outweigh the cost during the week, or do you find that you have more um, mental health um, distress related calls at the weekends? Yeah, I suppose, sorry, and that from uh, our, our policing perspective. Realistically, we find that um, the volume of calls is quite uniform across the week, and if anything, um, probably the, um, the first part of the week, sort of Sunday, Monday, and the Tuesday are probably slightly higher. Um, weekends inherently, you know, are, are particularly you know, busy for many policing sort of purposes. Um, the reason we have um, been working at weekends with the MAT service really is purely to um, you know, facilitate um, our mental health practitioners who are realistically, you know, absolutely key and crucial to the service. Um, so, you know, again, I have yeah. to, particularly, you know, colleagues from the South Eastern Trust and uh, Belfast Trust who are stepping up to the mark week in, week out, and um, providing this service over and above and in addition to the, the, their core working week. Um, Again, we as a police service and, and, and uh, our colleagues in the ambulance service are, you know, a regional service. We work twenty four seven anyway. So um, again, the, the, the level of you know, support that are in the mental health uh, arena have given cannot be underestimated. Okay, so um, for example, if there are paramedics or mental health social workers or psychiatric nurses um, or police here today and um, listening in is there a way that if they work in the South Eastern Trust or the Belfast Trust that they can get involved? For mental health practitioners Sarah we employ band seven staff that currently work in crisis and they do extra hours in bank and again because staff are working and making a decision autonomously in regarding someone's mental health we felt that band seven staff would be more appropriate and we do pay staff bank rates so it's above and beyond their hours and again anybody that works in the trust absolutely i mean we're they're more than welcome to come and do a shadow shift and from that they can decide but we like to keep the team small and cohesive to build relationships and for staff to know the practice um okay so if a client has to go to a hospital following um an assessment from the MAP team. Is there any follow-up offered from you? So if we um, go out to a patient and we have assessed them and we feel that their medical presentation um, warrants an admission to hospital, um, if we've completed our assessment, we would share that with our partners and um, our partner liaison service at the, the local hospitals. We also have a working um, agreement with our partners in the ED. So we have um, a pathway where we can um, admit a patient through the ED expedient to share the information. Um, and we would then update the colleagues um, within the Belfast Trust or the Southeastern Trust that are on shifts or they're on scheduled care or the mental health at night um, service offered by Southeastern Trust. Can I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just sort of add a wee point there uh, as far as okay. quality? I know one of your colleagues, or, uh, one of the ED doctors said earlier, um, fully agree and sort of support the, the idea that you know, ED is not the right place. But I think it's important for, for everyone um, to remember that our starting point with, with the MAT service is to try and avoid an attendance at ED really from the get-go. Um, so you know, that's not taking any unnecessary risks and certainly that's you know, the beauty of having our mental health colleagues, you know, working side by side, you know, with us as police officers and, and obviously paramedics. So in some respects, it's kind of a bad day at the office for us if we have to take someone to ED. Um, it's not in any way a failing, but anybody that we take to ED, you know, as a result of interaction with the MAD is, if I can put it this way, definitely a, a more, a, a definitely more needed case to go to ED than a lot that we see. Again, I know um, statistically for us as police, you know, for the amount of people that we ED, we are, you know, in the understanding that probably only somewhere in the region of one to two percent of people who appear at ED then go on to be admitted for, you know, to hospital thereafter. So, you know, if we can cut those numbers down, it really is a win-win for everybody involved. You know, it's it's less time, you know, police are spending at hospitals unnecessarily. It's you know, it's less time and more time that we can commit to frontline police and services. Yeah. Okay, so obviously this is a branch um, of the police service and the ambulance service, and as you said, it's on top of people's um, normal working jobs. Um, what sort of training do you provide for people who step up to the MAT team? Because obviously we've talked before about um, the police and um, ambulance service 
um, not really having as much training in well, in their like degree courses and things initially. Yeah, I, I suppose, sir, is, is your question sort of more focused about what sort of training did police get or what sort of training did the MAP team collectively have? Yeah, coll collectively, so MAP team collectively. I mentioned um, police and ambulance service because it was mentioned before that they didn't feel um, as capable of dealing with mental health related issues. Yeah, well, again, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, that, again, that is the whole, uh, you know, thrust and, um, you know, beauty of having a mental health professional you know, at, at your side. For us, it means that uh, a lot of that responsibility can be taken off uh, police officers. And I, I think uh, Dr. Dorman mentioned earlier there, as far as, you know, patients presenting the surgeries, you know, and having the luxury of, um, you know, some time to, 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 you know, to diagnose or some time to sort of you know, interact with. You have to remember that whenever the MAP service is not available, police officers are challenged to make those dynamic assessments on the spot. Um, and, and so that's where, you know, the MAP service themselves really come into their own. You know, police are, you know, very often first responders to all these crisis type incidents. And yet we're probably the last people who really should be there. Um, so maybe that's something, again, that the, you know, the wider audience want to think about and possibly comment on. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose I can expand a wee bit on that, Sarah. So um, part of when we set up the pilot, we were very ambitious about um, training and um, sharing our skills and our knowledge. Um, but as an organisation, we, we were very focused on setting up a training matrix along with this. So we have delivered education sessions to NIAS, to the police. Um, we have went wherever anybody would allow us to go to educate and share about um, our service. We also have internal training, so um, we will educate the, the colleagues that work with us. We will learn from them and they will learn from us. And that knowledge then will be shared out and they will engage um, with a better understanding of mental illness, how to engage with our clients, uh, um, to work with them in partnership, how to empower them to make decisions. They then take that knowledge um, into their everyday practice. So um, we aim, the part of, although part of the project is about um, enhancing the experience, we're ultimately wanting to, to link in with our organization, with the police and working um, in partnership by educating their, their workforces and then upskilling the interactions that they have all the time with clients with mental health difficulties. And then just a specific question on that, did you, um, did you have any training on communication, um, communi communication aware um, from the SALT speech and language therapy? We, we, honest, we did. Very naive in, in terms of like what that involves and things. So if you are listening and did submit that question, maybe a specific, more specific question would be helpful. Um, okay, so obviously the phone first pilot scheme is being rolled out across emergency departments. How will MAP link in with this? Sorry, can you repeat the question, Sarah? Yeah, so the, are you aware of the phone first program in emergency departments? Sarah, basically, already divert from ED and reduce the footfall in ED and increase it in the positive experience for patients being seen in their own home. Yeah. So, I, you, you talked about getting referrals from 999 and 111, um, and then I think patients are now being encouraged to phone, phone emergency department first before they just present. So, will you get involved in the, the more self referrals as opposed to just the, the 999 and the 111 calls? Does that make sense? Yeah, sir, that would be a different service. That is for people that intend to attend AP. Yeah, the calls that we have are people that actually phone the emergency services first. So that would be someone that phones the police or NIAS, that, the type of calls we respond to. But I mean, we, it's an, an ever evolving project, so we're not sure what will actually happen in the future, whilst it continues to evolve. I suppose um, to expand a wee bit on that there, um, we in nature are diverting, so those clients that would naturally go to the ED, um, they may contact the ambulance service first, so the ambulance service may refer that to us as a preventative interaction so that that person then subsequently doesn't need to attend at the ED. So 
by, by us being active and engaged, it may re reduce the, the amount of contact with the ED and hopefully partnership along with that. Um, we obviously, as an organisation, will always bring the, the ED departments first to let them know if we're coming. But if we are coming to the ED, it's usually on the back of a medical. Um, if it's relation to their mental health distress, then usually we are de-escalating that there in the community. Yeah, great. So um, I think there's just a wee bit of a little on the questions here. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so please ask again, this is the question I asked to rephrase. Did the Southeastern Trust involve speech and language therapy in their training um, with the emphasis on the importance of communication and informed communication? I will be 100% honest and say no. Um, so the, the delivery that um, we we did, and so we've had several training days with our partners in the PSNI and NIAS, um, and that there was the aim to upskill in relation to mental health. So we delivered mental health awareness. Um, all the PSNI officers and NIAS officers were offered STORM training, and they undertook the STORM training, and um, then we did the spoke. So, um, identified need of the population that we were training, we identified the needs from them and then we upskilled them in those specific areas. However, we are hosting a training day and if that speech and language person would like to get in contact with us, um, there may be an opportunity for them to become part of that if they feel that there is relevant education that they can share with us and our partners. Absolutely, and um, I appreciate you, you being honest. Um, I think part of this is about recognising um, areas that we haven't, we aren't as strong in. So yeah, thank you to whoever asked the question. Um, from, hold on, Sorry. Sarah. Yes. Sarah, I was going to say, you know, I think you know what, what I keep sort of hearing is this word training, training, training. You know, um, repeated sort of quite a lot, and I think it's something that just rolls off all our tongues quite easily whenever we talk about sort of mental health and as far as you know. Um, a policing response, for example, is concerned, you know, police need more training, police need more training. And I'm not so sure convinced that that's always the case. I, I think the word training itself um, certainly suggests that we should be skilled mental health workers. Um, and, and I would certainly, you know, make the, you know, the, the claim sort of very, you know, openly that I don't feel that that is the case. You know, we don't need to be trained mental health workers whenever we have such good collaboration, certainly beginning and developing, you know, with, with our health colleagues here. Certainly, I think there's room for improvement from our perspective of raising awareness and having a better understanding. But for me, that's something completely different from, from that word training. Possibly splitting hairs a little, but, but I think it's an important point to be made. So. Mm -hmm. okay. And am I correct? I, I might not be correct in saying this, but am I correct in saying that um, Lifeline can make referrals to, like Lifeline can say, can speak to someone who's, who's rung my number and they can say, you need to phone 999. Is there an opportunity for a pathway for those who Lifeline would normally refer to 999 for them to refer directly to the MAP team? Again, Sarah, yes. We're just we're currently finishing the pilot project and we hope to have funding for a further year. But again, that is something else that we can look at. John Handy, um, my equal in Belfast Trust, also manages Lifeline. So that is the way we are going to move forward. Brilliant. So uh, I think we are getting a wee bit of a lull in the math team question specifically. So we're going to branch out um, into the multidisciplinary kind of style questions. Um, I know it's a bit more daunting because you haven't a clue what to accept. Um, okay, so um, let's see, where are we? Are? Right. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily a flow to this, but we'll just, we'll just fire away. <laughs> So um, there's a strong evidence, and this is for this is for you, Jenny. There's a strong ev evidence between physical and mental health coexisting. Um, what contribution are registered physiotherapists giving to the multidisciplinary services that currently exist? Are there plans to develop their role in mental health? Thanks, Sarah. That's that's a very relevant question and, and very relevant in the context of the current mental health strategy and as part of the reform of um, of all services post COVID. Um, there is um, absolute evidence of, of the positive impact of physiotherapy in improving 
um, particularly within the acute and trauma service. And there is, there has been some work done in, in, in actually in the Belfast Trust. Um, is there enough? Is, is, is this well established? Absolutely not. Um, and the, in, you know, in my work in supporting the, you know, the draft mental health strategy, I had set up, I'd asked the public health agency to set up a allied health professions mental health network to inform exactly those type of initiatives as, a, as an expert panel and resource to be able to bring together exactly that type of initiative so that it can be fed up, you know, in, into the system so that as services are being reformed or as the implementation of the mental health strategy um, starts to take shape that exactly those type of initiatives that we don't and services that don't exist across Northern Ireland have an opportunity to be considered. Right, super. And then Grace, um, just to ask, can referrals be made from SHIP, from the community mental health team? What's the community mental health team referring to SHIP? Is that the question? Yes, I think so. Okay, yes. Um, Yes and no. It depends. Um, as per trust area within the Southern Trust, um, it's the primary care and mental health team that can refer into SHIP. And within the Southeastern Trust, um, the community mental health team can refer in as long as the client is only with them for a short period of time. Okay, thank you very much. And then uh, Susie, um, do you think that we are informing frontline staff, the likes of yourself, of the importance of verbal first aid? Um, which has the potential to reframe, reframe a memory of a traumatic event and prevent PTSD? Uh, I don't think we are. Um, just to go back, I suppose the word training has been floating around. I think um, we could probably be doing a lot more as frontline staff and as emergency doctors and nurses specifically. Um, we do receive training. Um, it's part of it's part of what we have to be able to do but in terms of the language we use um, as I said earlier often these presentations are out of ours often there is a lot of other things going on often these patients just to go back to to um, what Mark was saying from a PSNI point of view and from the MAT team's point of view um, these people can be in a really difficult spot and can be physically quite unwell um, and I think we probably aren't brilliant at watching what we're saying sometimes because the acuity of the situation can be difficult. Tempers can start to rise or emotions can run high. And as we said earlier, the police can be there and things. So I think that's definitely something that we can work on. Um, it's a traumatic place to be for a lot of patients. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's definitely, definitely something we could, we could do a bit more on, I think. Okay. Do you have any ideas for how we can, like, how we can improve that? If, if you don't, don't worry. <laughs> I mean, always welcome. You know, training is always welcome. I suppose for us, getting the time um, to undertake, you know, specific training with regards to, to mental health is difficult. Um, but I feel, as I said earlier, you know, speaking openly and, and agreeing with with a lot of my colleagues here, you know, it's not our only job. Um, so it probably gets neglected um, and although it's a big issue and I think a lot of people are passionate about it and want to be better um, it's not always the most pressing thing um, and I think having the experts come in and, and show, you know language is one of those things that like when someone tells you you think oh my goodness of course we should say it more like this and you know um, so yeah if anyone wants to come and teach us all how to do that, that would be great. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Um, and then another question directed to the MAP team. Um, does the multi-agency triage team use a trauma-informed approach? And if you know what that is, it'd be very, oh, they've disappeared. If you, if you explain a wee bit about what they mean when they're saying trauma-informed approach. Well, actually, we can talk um, quite quite lengthy about this, but I won't go into it. We've actually um, used the sequential intercept model placed over our um, organisation to try and journey a patient from point of entry to point of ex exit. So we are 
reasonably trauma-informed but not nowhere near as where we would like to be our vision would be to be better trauma-informed so we actually are presenting at a webinar and the four nations mm -hmm. webinar with regards to this specific topic but trauma-informed as you know is um very publicized at the minute we are very aware about the trauma that our clients experience and how we can um, inadvertently re-traumatize them or negatively impact on their journey and um, so we have went through our whole service we have mapped it out we have put the trauma lens over our service and we have identified areas of improvement from upskilling and training our staff in um, trauma-informed awareness in the ACE training and um, for our call managers and our place and our NIAS colleagues to um, undertaking specific trauma-informed training for our staff we're also looking at having a trauma-informed assessment, um, our referral forms, our assessment documents. Um, yes, yeah, so we are very, very um, embedded in this process currently. It is something we're very passionate about in our project, and we do feel that we will work to be more trauma-informed in our, for our clients. Just, just for those who don't um, know what you're meaning by being trauma-informed, could you give like a, like a brief summary of what, what a trauma-informed approach is? So what it is, is acknowledging that everybody has um, the potential to have trauma in their life. So this is not just necessarily the clients we encounter, but also the staff that encounter with those clients. Um, trauma, um, people that experience trauma have many triggers that we may not be aware of, and those triggers can be activated at any point. Um, we are very aware of um, telling your story and retelling your story and how traumatic that can be. And if you're transported from one service to another to another and asked to retell your story, to those people it is very traumatizing and um, but also things like the environment can traumatize you and um, if you've had adverse experience with the police if you've had physical adverse experience and then you have a paramedic arriving at your house so it's about trying to be informed in every interaction that you have with that client to minimize the trauma impact that we have in them but we're also looking at the staff staff may have specific traumas when they're interacting with something that may adversely impact on the dynamic of you and a client so we are looking at being tra trauma informed for the client's journey and making sure that we support them as best we can we share the relevant parts of their story that are required so that they don't have to retell it we look at documents that are not repetitive in nature so that we're not continually asking them to talk about very emotive things and then we use their trauma um, experience as well as what they're presenting with so that we ensure a holistic plan for that person so that they are not we informed trauma wise in their interventions. Brilliant, thank you so much for explaining that. I'm going to jump back to um, Jenny. There's a question here um, asking is there scope to include non-talking slash creative arts therapies in immediate mental health referrals? What are your thoughts on this? And as I said in my sort of in my in my piece, this is an area that I am particularly interested in. Mm -hmm. um, the current answer is no, that is not a service that's available. Um, and that is why I am so um, encouraged and excited about the um, mental health strategy, because the mental health strategy very clearly um, draft mental health strategy, I should say, very clearly you know, makes reference to the fact that there is a need for those professions which currently don't provide mental health services to be considered and to look at, you know, those interventions and services that we don't currently have within our service, you know, to identify what they are and what their evidence base and to consider them in our five and 10 year plan. So the, the, the not nice answer is at, at the moment there isn't, you know, trusts can choose to um, buy in those services, but they're not part of the core mental health service as it stands. But the mental health strategy, I, I think, gives us a, a marvellous opportunity to reimagine really how mental health services can be shaped for the next five to ten years. And then just jumping back to Susie, um, is there full-time mental health cover in ADs in Northern Ireland? Um, so I think that question will depend on which trust you work um, and services will sort of vary. Generally speaking, um, access to liaison psychiatry is usually 24 hours. So we will see the patient initially and make an assessment if the patient's intoxicated um, or they've taken you know, a significant overdose or, or, or there's something else going on. 
you know, we, we won't refer those patients straight away to mental health. We might seek advice, um, but generally those patients will need to stay a bit longer and they can see services in the morning. And um, if patients are sort of otherwise stable, um, we, we can make a phone call. Now, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but, but, but often from midnight on, services can be a bit limited. Um, before COVID, um, often based on psychiatry would maybe be covering um, multiple sites and things. So it's tight and they're under a lot of pressure. They're covering, you know, often more, more than just us as well. So just a few considerations to take, take into account. But generally, there's, there's someone available at the end of the phone, um, at least for some advice on, on the best sort of course of action. And also just information if the patient, we can't really see all the mental health records. So, so getting a bit of information if they're known to services and if there's anything else that we could maybe be doing for them to try and um, facilitate. Okay. Right. Um, and I think we'll start to finish up. So just one last question. I'm going to ask you, Grace. Um, how important do you think the advances in digital technology within health and social care be to widen the reach of mental health services and the communication between service user and professionals? I can repeat the question if you'd like. <laughs> you know, well, I suppose, but from a ship perspective, you know, using the telephone video call methods of counselling means that clients can avail of their sessions despite um, ge ge geographical um, areas or issues as well. For example, we would have a lot of clients who would have childcare issues, so they're able to put their children to bed and avail of their counselling sessions at eight o'clock that evening, so rather than having to go and see somebody face to face. However, However, there is another argument that counselling is better face to face as well. So I think it's very dependent on the client that is referred to us. But even in sense of um, you know multidisciplinary working with other teams, virtual online meetings has been a great opportunity to connect with one another, have our meetings from one another and learn from one another because you're not having that traveling from one end of the country to another. So I definitely think you know the pandemic has positives in that respect for, for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. So um, I'm going to ask Victoria to demute all of you again and we're going to move on to our next session.